Okay. Okay. Welcome to all of you joining us today for this uh, webinar, Marine Cloud Brightening, a Governance Dilemma, which is a GAZAM C2G side event at the UN Oceans Conference. Uh, I'm Chris Vivian, co-chair of GAZAM Working Group 41, and I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction to GAZAM and C2G. So... Right, so GAZAMP is a joint group of experts on the scientific aspects of marine environmental protection. It's an interagency body of the United Nations established in 1969. And across the bottom there of that slide, you can see the UN agencies that are uh, part of uh, GAZAMP that sponsor GAZAMP. I won't go into all the other details of how the body works. I don't think uh, you need to know that at the moment, but you can refer to that later in the recording. And GAZAM Working Group 41 that I co-chair on Ocean Interventions for Climate Change Mitigation it used to be called the Working Group for Marine Geoengineering. And we had a couple of overall objectives when we started in 2015 to better understand the potential environmental and socioeconomic impacts of various types of these climate interventions in the ocean and to provide uh, advice to the London Protocol parties to assist them in identifying those techniques that it might be sensible for listing in the new Annex 4 of the Protocol. And we carried out a high level review of these proposed techniques, which was published in March 2019. You can see on the right there the report, which is available on the GAZAM website. Uh, just a few key points uh, since that report, we have some new terms of reference for some key issues that we feel needs to be addressed. And the first one is to develop a framework to integrate in inputs from natural sciences and societal disciplines into a holistic assessment of ocean interventions for climate change mitigation. That's a major issue that we're working on currently. Also to develop a flowchart questionnaire with associated guidance to elicit information from proposers so that we can actually try and sensibly assess them. And the other big issue, providing advice to London protocol parties to identify, as I said already, those techniques that it might be worth considered for listing and some other issues that are mentioned there in terms of issues to be addressed in an assessment framework initial assessment of monitoring verification and identifying significant gaps in knowledge and uncertainties. And finally, we also want to stimulate information gathering to fill those widespread knowledge gaps. And finally, quick slide about C2G. The Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative is an independent initiative entirely funded by philanthropy. Its mission is to catalyze governance frameworks for climate altering approaches in particular for large scale carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation modification. And C2G is impartial on the potential use or non-use of any of those approaches or techniques. And uh, there I'll hand it over to Miranda now, I think. And stop sharing. Yes, thank you, Chris. If you could stop sharing your screen, that'd yep. be great. Hi everyone, uh, yeah, my name is Miranda Butcher. I'm also a member of the Gazamp Working Group 41 that Chris just uh, told you a little bit about. And I have the pleasure of moderating the discussions today. So um, as you know, we're here to discuss marine cloud brightening as a governance dilemma. Um, and the background to this discussion is the growing concern that actions currently being undertaken by the global community are not going to be enough to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and some vulnerable places in the world are already experiencing impacts. For example, the Great Barrier Reef has been severely damaged by several marine heat waves recently. And to reduce the heat stress to the reef, a group of Australian researchers and engineers are conducting outdoor experiments on marine cloud brightening by seeking to whiten clouds over the ocean and thus reflect solar radiation back into space. And as you probably know, marine cloud brightening is one type of a range of approaches called uh, solar radiation modification or SRM that may have the potential to protect the environment from the risks of a warming climate, but could in turn uh, create novel risks and governance challenges. And these can inc include concerns that research into solar radiation modification approaches to deal with the effects of climate change might distract distract the world from dealing with the cause of climate change by um, reducing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 
But at the same time, uh, scientists, policymakers and societies across the world do not know enough about the potential risks and benefits of marine cloud brightening and other types of solar radiation modification approaches um, that they need to know to be able to make uh, well-informed decisions about their use. And so research is really needed to fill these knowledge gaps. And of course, this raises uh, lots of challenging questions. How do we weigh up the risk of doing research uh, against the risk of not knowing whether um, or not marine cloud brightening and other solar radiation modification approaches might be a useful climate uh, might be useful climate response options. And uh, what can society learn from the Australian Marine Cloud Brightening Project about the governance of uh, SRM research? And so um, this, this uh, event brings together five panelists for, with different uh, backgrounds to share their insights on these challenging questions. Um, and today we'll start with introductions from the panelists uh, and some br brief inputs by them um, on why they're interested in this topic. And then I have some questions for each of them. And after that, we'll move into a question and answer session with the audience. Um, before we have some closing remarks by Janos Pastor, Executive Director of C2G. If you, uh, members of the audience, have questions for the panelists during the discussions, please add them to the Q&A box, not the chat box, but the Q&A box, and we will take them up during the question and answer session. So now I would like to invite each of our panelists to briefly introduce yourselves and tell us why you're interested in this topic. Very briefly, maximum two minutes, please. Uh, Daniel, uh, if you could start, that'd be great. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Daniel Harrison, and I'm a biological oceanographer at Southern Cross University here in Australia. And my background is, is in engineering and, and then a PhD in science. So I, I have a focus in my research on, on looking at the technical side of ocean-based solutions to various problems that, that humans have created in the oceans. Uh, and in the climate system, our, our ecosystems in the ocean are under more stress now than they have been since humans first started walking on the planet. And so I feel that we have a, a duty to try and help those ecosystems um, to, to prosper under the, the new world that we've created for them to live in. Um, I lead the cooling and shading sub program of the reef restoration and adaptation program here in Australia. And our program is, is focused on, on finding uh, additional management interventions that we can use uh, beyond those sort of traditional conservation management options that, that have been applied to the reef so far. And so these novel interventions that we're looking at cover a whole gambit of things, but amongst them is, is marine cloud brightening. And I'm interested in this technology because as, as we've modeled all of the different interventions that we're looking at to help the reef, um, cloud brightening should it should it work in uh, as we as we sort of uh, you know under a more optimistic type scenario of, of, of expecting that, that it could work um, within the, the sort of bounds of, of, of what we understand at the moment which, which is a lot of uncertainty around that um, but should it work the modeling shows that it's it's one of the most promising interventions to sort of preserve the reef as we know it as opposed to to try to replace corals, for example, um, with, with hardier species. Great, thanks very much, Daniel. Um, then we'd move to uh, Phil. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Phil Williamson. Uh, I'm based at the University of East Anglia, Norwich, UK, uh, where I'm an honorary reader. Uh, for most of my working professional life, I've been for working with the Natural Environment Research Council in the UK the funding body, uh, and I've been involved in, in coordinating and planning and helping to implement projects without actually doing the research myself. Uh, but the, my link with the uh, ocean interventions uh, started about 30 years ago with the first ocean fertilization experiments for iron addiction that were carried out uh, by UK scientists and US researchers as well in the Southern Ocean. And since then, I've been involved with the a SOLAS international program that reviewed the uh, success or failures of ocean fertilization as far as we know it for the science aspects of it, how successful was it in getting carbon down into deeper waters. And that expanded and developed into interest into ocean interventions more generally uh, with work for the uh, Convention of Biological Diversity, the CBD, with a first report in 2012 on uh, climate geoengineering in general uh, about its sort of scientific effectiveness, but also its political feasibility and I then did a second report to the CBD in 2016 and also followed up 
uh, with other reviews and assessments, including for Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, involvement in a review for uh, the, the, the Ocean, Cryosphere and Climate Change Assessment of a few years ago. So I've, I've broadened in scope, but most of my background has been biological, uh, but also interest in, in the ocean interventions more generally. Thanks very much, Phil. And then we would move to Ishita. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Ishita Yadav, and I'm from Bangalore, India. Um, I currently serve as South Asia's regional focal point on SDG 7 at the United Nations Major Group for Youth and Children. And I coordinate the city's working group of Yongo, which is the youth constituency to the UNFCCC. And for the past five years, I've been bolstering meaningful youth engagement in the multilateral climate governance sphere by elevating youth voices at high level negotiations and leading community organizing projects around climate mitigation. Um, as an environmental journalist at One Earth, I specialize in highlighting unheard rural climate solutions. And in fact, it was here where my engagement in geoengineering began. Um, it was during my climate solutions journalism fellowship, um, where my colleagues and I worked on a solar radiation modification project, particularly exploring issues around its governance. Um, since then, I've been like, helping to expand the the global conversation around SRM in whatever way I can. I've ran uh, informal workshops at the SDG7 Youth Constituency and also here in Bangalore. And beyond youth engagement, I've also been voicing my ideas on SRM as a youth member on the International Renewable Energy Agency's Global Council on SDG7. Um, and yeah, I think SRM has so much potential and you know, for the world to be better placed in 2050 or 2040 to take the relevant action, um, discussions on you know, research and governance needs to be well underway in 2022. And young people need to be meaningfully engaged in every step of the way, especially young people from marginalized groups, um, young people living in rural and remote areas who often find themselves facing multiple barriers and engaging in policies which in fact affect them the most. Um, I believe that these groups uh, need to be engaged in order to develop um, sustainable, just and inclusive climate governance. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Simone. Hello everyone, it's great to be here with you. Um, uh, very quickly, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm uh, a legal i um, a professional, I'm an academic at the University of Malta. Uh, I've been working in international environmental law for 31 years and uh, with particular specialization on, on climate issues and more recently on the climate ocean nexus. It has always been my passion to work with scientists and with engineers and with other professions in the multidisciplinary um, fora uh, to, to bridge the relationship between science and scientific reports and policy and law. That has always been um, my major role, even um, as an advisor to my government. I appear here today, however, in my personal capacity, and I'm very interested um, to find how one can pave the way for governance of this issue, because in reality, there is no governance, there is no law that is regulating this issue. And, and I think that is the most dangerous uh, position of all, because when you when something is not regulated, it can lend itself to abuse. Uh, obviously, there are many dilemmas, which we will hear about today. Uh, and it, this is the way to address them by having an open objective dialogue. Um, from a multidisciplinary one to understand better the implications and how these can be addressed. I think it is high time that this dialogue starts and uh, I will look very forward to what the other panelists and the um, other members, the other participants have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but definitely not least, Jan. Uh, thanks, everybody. Hello, welcome uh, to the discussion and thanks for having me. My name is Jan MacDonald. I'm joining you today from the unceded lands of Lutrawitta, Tasmania, which is Australia's southern island state. And I pay my respects to the Palawa people of Tasmania who continue to care for this uh, beautiful land and sea country that I'm lucky enough to call home. 
I'm a professor of environmental and climate law at the University of Tasmania. I have a particular interest in the governance, the domestic governance of climate adaptation and novel climate interventions. So I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion with Simone because from my perspective, there's plenty of governance. It's just not necessarily at the international level. Uh, I'm currently leading a project funded by the Australian Research Council that's examining how national laws and national frameworks can be used as a platform for the governance of solar radiation management research and development, not at the deployment stage. And as part of that project, we're obviously looking at what lessons can be learnt from Australia's national experience with marine cloud brightening. So that's my particular interest tonight. Wonderful. Thanks very much, everyone, and, and welcome. Um, I'd like to move into the questions that I have uh, for you before we open it up for audience questions. So, Phil, if we could start with you. Um, you mentioned you were involved in the development of the uh, CBD stance on, on uh, deliberate climate interventions, uh, in, which includes marine cloud brightening. Could you give us an insight on how the CBD decision on geoengineering is relevant for these types of marine cloud brightening experiments? I think you're still on mute, Phil. We can't hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, the CBD uh, looked into all forms of geoengineering, but it was stimulated by ocean fertilization. But they passed resolutions that uh, are arguably are, uh, are not absolutely binding, but they are uh, certainly very strong guidance that countries should not engage in, in geoengineering and research unless it's at a very low scale, unless it's very uh, regulated. And they, they did sort of pass some of the responsibility for the marine side to the uh, to the uh, London Convention, London Protocol uh, for the regulation of marine issues. And, and Chris Vivian is more uh, expert on, on, on that and, and, and for, the, for the gay sample review is, is uh, uh, fleshing out what, what the, the advice and developments might be. But overall, overall, the CBD position was quite clear that the, the countries of the world that were signatories to and parties to the CBD did not like the idea of geoengineering, did not wish to see geoengineering develop as a, uh, a response to climate, and certainly the, the more technological uh, uh, interventions uh, were considered to be uh, risky, they were considered to be unfair, they were considered to be uh, sort of ignoring the problem in the sense of, of not tackling the root cause. Now, I think 10 years ago, that the choice was far more to say, should we reduce emissions or should we carry out geoengineering? Now the realisation is that we've got to do both, but we don't call geoengineering. Geoengineering is, is, is the sort of the, um, the word that, 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 that's faded away a little bit because of the carbon dioxide removal side of things. It can come such a wide spectrum from, from forest planting to, to natural solutions. And the question is, well, is that still geoengineering if it's, if it's a natural solution? Now, we want the, the, it's not, not an easy uh, break to make, but whereas planting trees on land is seen generally regarded as not do engineering and a good thing, but for, for uh, encouraging plant growth in the ocean through ocean fertilization, that is considered geoengineering. Now, marine cloud brightening is clearly a physical uh, change to the climate. The issue, I think, that, that comes out in, in the international discussions most strongly is what is a sort of national worry and responsibility and what's an international one. Where is the dividing line between impacts that affect just a place where the intervention is carried out and where the intervention affects the wider world. And if the intervention affects the wider world, then the wider world ought to have a say in whether it goes ahead or not, because there will be some, uh, some countries, some peoples who might uh, have disadvantage and might suffer from that. Now, for marine cloud brightening, overall, from a global perspective, yes, it might reduce or it's intended, it's expected to uh, reduce global temperatures it will also change weather patterns. And that's, in a sense, what it's intended to do. Because if you alter the, uh, the cloud brightness and mob part of the ocean, then you will alter the weather patterns, you will alter the climate. This has uh, implications that might be overall beneficial, but there will also be some downsides. This is really sort of the nub of the governance issue, the scale, the impacts, not just the local community, but the world as a whole. Thank you very much, Phil, already bringing up some really important uh, issues there about 
uh, scale and levels of governance that might be relevant for, for, for these types of activities. I'm going to Simona now. What do you see as, as the key issues of solar um, radiation modification and its governance? Um, what, what key information do you think is still missing that is needed to make decisions on whether these types of approaches should be researched and or deployed? Simona, you're also still on mute, unfortunately. We still can't hear you now. You'll have to unmute yourself, I'm afraid. Has someone with host rights managed to unmute Simona for us? Okay. All yes, right. I couldn't. Hi. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Wonderful. Go I am um, sorry about that. So to continue uh, upon what Philip was saying, in fact, perhaps uh, the biggest concern, I believe, and the, the the lack of enthusiasm to to debate the issue, lies in the fear that uh, this will take us back to the option which Philip referred to, that we instead of tackling the source of the harm, that is the uh, the green. Um, phasing out fossil fuels, which are the, the source of harm that are causing climate change induced by humans, we would have this other option as an easy way out. I think that is the biggest concern that many states have, especially those that have worked so hard to uh, push for the Paris Agreement and who work, are continuing to work so hard for the green transition to increase ambition and really um, accelerate uh, climate neutrality. I think that is the primary issue of concern. Having said that, the fact that the IPC it's, IPCC itself has highlighted that it could possibly be um, required, or actually they actually recommended that it is um, it, it would be required to to have some form of modification, human induced modification, as opposed to nature based solutions, which the climate regime proposes. Um, that in itself already shows that uh, there is a lot of information, scientific information, that the, the temperature offshoot is, 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 is a reality. And there could need, be needed some form of supplementary help to all the efforts made by human, even, so humans, even if we're going to reach car carbon neutrality or climate neutrality by mid-century, which is the Paris Agreement's target, even if we manage to accelerate that, uh, which we are not doing at the moment. We know that some states are still procrastinating and saying they will reach climate neutrality after 2050, which is definitely not uh, what what uh, not good news. Then we need something to help us um, in in accelerating the process. But this, I think, needs to be made clear that any form of um, activity in this sense would need to be supplementary to all possible ambition. Um, accelerated ambition to reach climate neutrality as soon as possible. Um, having said that, um, there are other issues. There, the other issues would be the scale of risk, particularly. What would it entail? How would other countries be affected? How would the, how would the effects, uh, would there be any cross-border effects, for instance? Can human beings actually control, specifically control the type of modification that we're talking about? This is all related to a legal principle found in environmental law, which is the precautionary principle. That is that unless uh, one can prove that risk is minimal and can be in some way controlled, one cannot um, go ahead and, and carry out any activities that might cause harm um, beyond national borders, affecting other countries, affecting areas that are um, not subject to any jurisdiction. Obviously, countries can and have the sovereignty to exercise any form of activity they consider that um, could uh, fall within their environmental policy. And perhaps it is easier to control the effects of such um, experiments in a national level where, where the experiments can be more contained and one can study the effects. And this is the kind of perhaps um, information that is needed. What is the what is research telling us if Australia is carrying out these activities? What, what are the kind of uh, outputs and what are the results that they are uh, observing? And how 
can these be controlled? Is there is there a possibility of controlling them? I think this is the major the major concern, another major concern. And then the other points would be uh, how what about accessibility? If these uh, if this kind of research and the, and and the re in reality uh, such modification would be uh, beneficial. Is it available to all states or is it only the industrialized and the higher income states that have access to such research and to such um, experiments for modification? Or would this be available to all? Uh, and on whose behalf would these experiments be, be carried out? Um, would all states be represented? Would all states have a voice in ensuring that they will not be suffering from negative effects? Um, while some other countries will suffer, will enjoy the benefits, would other states suffer the consequences? To what extent would they be um, in a position to voice their concerns and to actually ensure that their interests are protected? I think these are the legal arguments um, that one has to understand uh, that are very crucial to allowing and regulating and governing um, uh, solar radiation modification. Even because, and I think one of the biggest dilemmas is that, uh, which is closely related to, to even to climate change and loss and damage issues, because while we know that human induced climate change is causing a number of um, deleterious effects, we are not able to point out the direct causal effect between what one state is doing and the effect suffered by other states elsewhere on the globe. So this, the inability to trace this direct link is in itself a dilemma because one cannot uh, measure exactly, one cannot trace the liability, the kind of legal responsibility from, one, from the actor to the victim, so as to say. I think I can stop here at this stage. Um, and uh, I, I conclude by, by underlining that having states like Australia um, carrying out this research and the observations that come out of these research programs at the national level will be definitely very helpful to you know, fuel the, the, the debate and, and give it more, more uh, uh, more information, the required information that it is need that is needed. Thank you. Thanks, Simona, and that's a uh, yeah, really good segue into asking Daniel uh, to give us uh, a little bit more information about the marine cloud brightening experiments in Australia. What are the key developments and challenges that you're facing? Thank you. So I think maybe the most useful thing for me to do is, is to start off maybe describing the idea of, of marine cloud brightening for the reef and, and how it actually differs from, from the idea of using marine cloud brightening in a, in a geoengineering sense. So the, the original definition of geoengineering was um, action with the intent to change the global climate. So to try and counteract the effects of, of global warming by either reducing carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, the, the carbon dioxide removal techniques, or by attempting to, to cool the planet back down and, and offset um, the, the greenhouse gas effect. Um, the, although the technology is, is similar, the, the marine cloud brightening is, is the process of trying to brighten clouds, um, which you might be able to use, use for either perhaps. Um, the idea of, uh, to use it on the reef is very fundamentally different than using it in a global sense. Um, in the Great Barrier Reef, the marine cloud brightening that, that we're considering would be applied intermittently. So, so only in years where there was a marine heat wave creating bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and, and then only over the period of, of the summertime when the reef and the corals are at, at risk of bleaching damage. So we're, we're talking about a, a similar technology, but um, applied just for a short amount of time as a, um, a responsive action to a marine heat wave in this case. I guess the other important difference is even the entire area of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park is about 0.07% of the, of the Earth's surface area. So less than 0.1% of the globe. Um, and so because of these, the risks and the potential benefits of, of doing cloud brightening over the reef are very fundamentally different uh, than trying to do marine cloud brightening um, to cool the planet. If you were to try and do that, you'd need to obviously uh, apply technology over much, much larger areas of the oceans. You'd 
you'd probably choose those areas where it worked best, where there are um, persistent marine stratocumulus cloud decks. Um, we don't necessarily have those over all of the Great Barrier Reef, um, but over the Great Barrier Reef, we need cloud brightening to work just well enough to, to alter the outcome of the corals. So to, to lower the stress on the corals enough that, that the mortality is lowered and, and that the ecosystem can, can survive. And so when we've, we've done modeling of the Great Barrier Reef and, and, and put marine cloud brightening into the models, one of the really interesting things that we've found is that it only works under Paris type climate change scenario. So from our point of view, there's absolutely no argument as to whether you, you could do cloud brightening and, and save the reef and, and keep um, emitting greenhouse gas emissions at the same time. It doesn't work. The marine cloud brightening helps a little bit, buys the reef an extra decade or two, but there's only uh, the, the, the fundamental science that there's only a, a limited response of the clouds, which, which is why it only works under very certain circumstances. Often the clouds are, are as bright as they can be. But under certain circumstances, which we think occur often over the reef, there's uh, they're not as bright as they could be, but there's a limited amount that you can brighten them. And, and even within that limited amount, it's a uh, law of diminishing returns. So, so for the first uh, extra concentration of aerosols of, of sea salt crystals that you add for the, for the cloud, crystal, sorry, cloud droplets to nucleate on, um, you, you get the maximum response and it, and it diminishes exponentially after that. So what this means is that, that basically it's essential that we have both the strongest possible action on climate change um, in conjunction with the marine cloud brightening maybe helps the reef. Um, in terms of the challenges, they're, they're also related to this, I think. I'd spend a lot more than the time available if I was to talk about all of them. But perhaps one of the most pertinent ones to this conversation is, is just scaling up the technology um, should it even be possible to the area of the reef is, is easily our biggest challenge. It's going to be immensely difficult uh, at the moment. The power requirements are very large. So doing it with renewable energy is, is difficult. Um, and, and at the moment, it's very, very difficult for me to see how you could ever scale this technology um, to be globally relevant. Um, that's not to say that there couldn't, of course, be some kind of breakthrough in the future that makes it possible. Um, but at the moment, that looks exceptionally unlikely to me. Um, I think our biggest challenge will be scaling it to, to make it work well enough over the reef. Um, I'll just go one more challenge and, and, and call it there. But I think the, the next fundamental challenge for us is just the huge level of uncertainty. So we've designed quite a large research program that, that covers, of course, the technology itself, but also the risks, the social aspects. We have a, a, um, a large social science component in our project, um, surveying the, the general Australian population, as well as stakeholders and traditional owner groups with a, a more direct interest in the reef. Um, we, we, we're looking at the risks, we're looking at the benefits, we're looking at, at how much it might cost to roll out this technology. Um, we're looking at how to try and, and power it with renewable energy. And across all of those things, they all have extremely high levels of uncertainty. So I think our other challenge is just how very, very early um, in this whole path that we might be in terms of, of even understanding the technology and understanding the, the fundamental cloud microphysical processes as well. Um, and so I think, I guess my, my point would be that I think it's, it's hard to do a good job in governing something that you don't understand the potential benefits and the potential risks. And so the research is, is key in improving our understanding. Thanks so much, Daniel. Um, yeah, and I think we'll, we'll go to Jan now because she has indicated she sees some potential for regional, national or even subnational legal instruments um, in filling you know, what might be an international governance gap for these types of, of research and, and deployment activities. Jan, could you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I'm not sure that I even see that there's an international governance gap in respect of marine cloud brightening as I think of it and as Daniel's talking about it, because at the moment, um, I, I think it is actually more appropriately conceptualized as an adaptation action rather than uh, squarely in the camp of solar radiation management. And I think it's worth uh, reminding the, the audience that the recent calls for a non-use agreement on um, solar radiation management techniques specifically acknowledge that it doesn't apply to these local level actions and they particularly name up 
marine cloud brightening as an example of the kind of adaptation uh, response that would fall outside the scope of a non-use agreement. Um, I, I should point out that we think about international law as uh, governing in a way that inhibits the use of these kinds of technologies. But it is worth pointing out that one of the key drivers for the MCV program in Australia is, of course, the looming prospect of the Great Barrier Reef being placed on the World Heritage in Danger list under the World Heritage Convention and Australia's very onerous obligations for protection of the reef under that convention. Uh, so there are elements of international law that you might actually think about as being facilitative or supportive of this kind of R&D. And you could even argue that the FCCC's um, expectation that we try to avoid dangerous anthropogenic climate change, uh, you know, I'm not for a moment uh, suggesting that this is an alternative to mitigation, but there are important elements of the international regime that speak to support for these kinds of initiatives. Um, in terms of Australia's um, framework, though, what I think we have in place, and Daniel will probably speak to this, I think, with more firsthand experience, is the, the, a, a framework governance regime that uh, I think provides a really important platform for other countries to consider. It provides an opportunity for Australia to export its experience to other coral reef countries, at least, bearing in mind that that's the focus uh, here at the moment. Um, what, we've, what we've done with the, um, the framework is take what's already a very sophisticated governance regime related specifically to the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, uh, where it has its own specialist agency, it has a, a very sophisticated zoning regime, there's policies governing all sorts of activities that can be conducted on the reef, including um, bespoke research governance frameworks. And on top of that has been um, implemented this policy specifically speaking to these proactive interventions. And what's interesting about that interventions policy is that it works from the premise that in interventions are necessary and that they are going to be the essentially the only thing that can sustain the resilience of the reef until we manage to stabilise temperatures. So it's an interesting um, uh, problem framing, if you like, in that respect. And so the interventions policy takes this you know, risk-based approach where there are some types of intervention that are considered to be just too high risk and, and will not be considered. But this kind of intervention doesn't fall into that category. They're talking there about, you know, genetic modification of coral species, for example, but marine cloud brightening falls within that sort of medium level of risk where um, these incremental uh, stepwise uh, or stepped change um, progressive experiments are going to be contemplated where each time you make an assessment of what's been learned, what the, what the issues are. I won't go into more detail because I think Daniel will talk more about it, but I'd be really happy to talk more about where I see the, the deficiencies in that regime. But I think that Australia has got a, a very good starting point um, it ticks nearly all of the boxes for any one of the codes of practice for research governing solar radiation management, whether it's the Asilma principles or the Oxford principles um, or any of the other ones that various SRM scholars have looked at. Um, you know, we've done some comparisons of, of how the regime stacks up here and we think it's actually performing quite well it's not perfect. There are some issues that I'd like to see improve, but um, yeah, it's it's a, an, an interesting way of thinking about it that doesn't start with the premise that we need international governance first. Thank you very much, Jen. A lot to dig into there. Um, I'd like to go now to Ishita and ask her, um, what role do you think young people um, such as yourself can and should play in discussions and decisions about um, whether to, to test or use marine cloud brightening and potentially other 
SRM approaches in the future. Um, thank you. Um, so I think youth involvement and leadership in geoengineering efforts are vital to achieving long-standing positive results. Um, over the next decade, young people will directly influence the outcome of SDG 13 as a key driver for its successful implementation. Um, youth empowerment and engagement um, facilitates a paradigm for change, uh, fostering innovation, advancing sustainable leadership, and promoting equality. Um, unfortunately, young people are not only disproportionately affected by the climate crisis, but are often excluded from policy and decision-making processes. Um, despite their active involvement in their communities and very strong commitment to advancing Agenda 2030. Um, I think this highlights the need um, to create enabling environments for young people to engage in policymaking frameworks um, as empowering young people from diverse backgrounds to engage in decision-making processes around frameworks um, such as marine cloud brightening and other solar radiation modification uh, approaches can have profound holistic benefits um, on governance structures. Um, governance frameworks developed now um, will be anticipatory and adaptable to circumstances in the future. And as the different scenarios of SRM play out, um, who better to understand the, the problems that may lie tomorrow than the individuals who will be there tomorrow, um, the leaders of tomorrow. I think if young people can be involved in a meaningful participatory process, um, sky's the limit. Um, young people bring fresh and creative energy. Youth are at the forefront of innovation. Um, they're developing new technologies. Um, they have like starting their own startups and in so many sectors from clean energy to waste management to transportation. And um, it, it, like SRM is so interdisciplinary. We never know what technology from what sphere can can come in and kind of mitigate the risks or, or scale up some of the ideas that we have now. And um, I think young people have, you know, proven to be one of the most resilient in the face of change. And I think that we can contribute in ways that, um, in ways that most, most stakeholders can't imagine, both technically and socially. Um, but this will only happen if um, they're empowered with, with quality education and training, finance and meaningful employment opportunities in the geoengineering sphere, um, which is gradually growing. Um, but as new opportunities come up, I'm sure that, you know, young people will be given the opportunity um, to contribute. And, you know, young people time and time again, they've participated and contributed and catalyzed some really important changes in our political system and power sharing dynamics, which I think is a is a very key issue around SRM is how to you know make sure that the power is fairly distributed and um, because some nations will clearly benefit more than others, young people can actually be a key player in ensuring that the power is is fairly distributed. And in this digital era, um, young people may be more open-minded, tolerant, and even more socially aware than some of the other stakeholders at the table. Um, as one of the most proactive group of young people have demonstrated their proficiency in engaging with diverse groups of stakeholders from academia and governance um, to indigenous communities and research groups, um, really helping consolidate their views. And um, I think if given the opportunity, young people can, can serve as a bridge. Um, they can be the common factor, like every community, whether that's indigenous, whether that's developing nations, whether that's the most developed nations, they all have youth and they're all striving to empower them. So this can actually be like a common factor, especially in terms of any barriers faced in international governments. Um, young people can really bridge the stakeholders and they can play a very central role in, in shaping a inclusive governance process, which I think is um, one of the core issues around SRM. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Well, um, I have a lot of further follow-up questions on what's already been said, but we do also want to give our, our audience a chance to, to uh, uh, ask questions. So I'd invite all the audience members to, to put uh, your questions in the Q&A box and I'll address them to the panelists. I'd also like to invite Chris Vivian and Janos Pastor to turn their cameras on at this point so they can also join in answering questions if, if need be. Um, we've already got a couple of, of questions uh, in the chat. Um, one, one from David Santillo that asks, given the relatively hands-off approach the authorities in Australia appear to have shown so far to the Whalex ocean fertilization studies, even where there are existing resolutions in place that would have, allow, have allowed detailed assessment, consultation and decision-making, what level of confidence can we have that there will be effective levels of governance and regulation in Australia in relation to marine cloud, cloud brightening? And I think um, I would ask Jan and, and, and Daniel to speak to this. You wanna go, go first, first, Daniel? Sure. Um, yeah. so, so, look, I, I, I can't speak to ALX and, and whatever they might be doing, of course, but I think this is a, a good opportunity to, uh, the last part of that question is, is how can we be confident about the Marine Cloud Brightening Project? And, and that I can answer quite confidently. So, and maybe I'll take the opportunity to talk a little bit about our governance structure. So, I guess it, it, it starts, and I'll try to talk less about this and, and leave it for Jan, but but the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, within which all of our, um, or under the jurisdiction of which all of our research takes place, is one of the best managed marine parks in the world. It's a federal agency um, that, as Jan mentioned before, has extremely specific risk assessment frameworks. So nothing, no research can be done in the marine park, even completely passive research, for example, just taking out an air quality sensor that, that creates no impact whatsoever, still needs to go through the entire Great Barrier Reef Marine Park assessment process. So that's one part, that's the, the, the federal legislation, and there's more that sits above that, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll leave that to Jan. Um, but within our program, um, just to give you a sense of, of the governance under, under which this research is taking place, we, we have a board that's made up of a, a member, uh, the, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research of each of the universities involved and a representative uh, from the two Australian federal government organisations involved, AIMS and the CSIRO. That board also has a traditional owner representative and two completely independent board members. Under the board sits a steering committee, uh, again, made up of a variety of, of representatives, including independents and, and both male and female traditional owner representatives on that board. Um, at, sitting with the board and the steering committee, um, we have a traditional owner advisory panel made up of, of, of Indigenous representatives. We have a risk subcommittee that specifically looks at the risks of interventions and specifically evaluates the research proposals, not, not just for marine cloud brightening, but for, the, for, for all of the research within the project, um, especially when it comes to field work, obviously, when there's a, a risk to the environment. Um, then even separate to that, we have a fully independent uh, risk review panel um, to, to then independently from the program itself, um, review risks associated with the research. Um, and then finally, within our program, um, we're, we're actually ourselves conducting research, of course, into the risks of all of the various interventions that, that might be applied to the Great Barrier Reef. Um, part of our research goals are, are, of course, not just to understand the potential benefits, but to understand the potential risks, both, both expected and, and unexpected. Um, and then just going back to something that was mentioned before, in, in terms of sort of disseminating the learnings, um, the intellectual property developed within our program, uh, the, the ownership of that intellectual property stays with whoever invented it, but they, by, by participating in the RAP program, they agree to give a worldwide unrestricted license, including the, the right to relicense, essentially allowing anyone in the world to use the technology that's, that's developed. Um, and then on top of all of that, um, we have extremely high levels of community engagement. So. Um, we, we and traditional owner engagement as well. So we have, we we're actually, I'm excited in, in a week after next, we'll have our first community reference panel that's been set up uh, to look at the interventions. And so that's made up of, of members of the general community in Northeast Queensland, 
It was an open call for expression of interest of people that would want to sit on that community reference people. It includes uh, young people, it includes a, a broad cross section of the, of the local community. Um, and, and we're, of course, working so uh, very, very closely with traditional owners. So, in fact, all of the, the research that we've conducted in my sub-program so far, uh, every field trip has, has actually involved a traditional owner um, representative that, that, that comes and, and participates in the research. And we're engaging closely with traditional owner groups, um, you know, not just to bounce ideas off, but to actually co-design the research. Um, Traditional owners have been looking after their sea country on the reef for tens of thousands of years um, and, and their voice needs to really re be respected. And because of that, we, we don't actually do any research whatsoever on the Great Barrier Reef without first having the free, prior and informed consent of the traditional owners of that, that specific sea country where we are doing the research. Um, so I, I think... I'll, I'll try and I'm not sure how long I've talked, but I'll try and keep it down. So I think um, hopefully that answers the question in terms of our project. Uh, we, we really hope that the levels of governance and community engagement and social science that we've put in place around our research um, you know, could act as an exemplar to other research groups interested in, in, in doing research on, on similar, uh, I guess, interventionist approaches to deal with some of the impacts of climate change where where there are so many voices and it is so cross-disciplinary and there are so many um, different, different interests and perspectives that need to be taken into account. Thanks, Daniel. Jen, you want to add to that? And perhaps also in doing so, you could speak to another question that we have. Will a guidebook be developed by Australia which identifies good practice for marine crowd brightening governance? Um, well, I think that I, I understood that the guidebook question was actually more about the technology and what, what worked and what didn't. And that's definitely in Daniel's um, wheelhouse. And I'm assuming that there'll be plenty of outcomes from uh, his research as it evolves in the next few years. Um, I, I, I did want to I guess reflect on that the the assumption that was in the question that had been asked, which was th this idea that the Australian government had taken a hands-off approach to Walex, and I don't know a lot about the Walex experiment, um, but I am confident that the reason that the first field test um, had been permitted was because it was for a narrow research purpose um, within the meaning of the London Protocol and therefore um, didn't require approvals under Australia's sea dumping legislation. Um, but my understanding is that they've made it very clear that if there's any scale up of that activity, even for research, they'll probably need to get a permit in Australia. And so I'm not, I'm not sure that I agree with the premise that the Australian government took a hands-off approach to that. And I'm not saying it did or didn't, I'm just not sure. But I don't think that the two are comparable. There are so, there's some overlap between the relevant agencies, but um, as Daniel's uh, said, and as I was making the point before, the activity on the Great Barrier Reef is principally governed by uh, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, was, which is established under its own statutory regime, um, and it has very clear statutory responsibilities. It, it is expected to manage the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park for a whole range of uses, but none of those uses can undermine uh, it's management for conservation. It is, it, it's, it's its number one purpose. And so the whole of um, the, the reef blueprint for resilience and the planning uh, over the next sort of 30 years for the reef is all about um, ensuring that it re remains as, as capable of withstanding climate shocks as we can possibly make it. And it's also really worth reminding the audience that the shading program, as Daniel said, is only one part of this comprehensive um, um, RRAP program. It includes a, a whole range of other interventions as well, including you know, it, bringing warm adapted corals, um, different types of coral farming techniques. So it's a multi-pronged approach of which the cooling and shading strategies are just a part. 
Thank you very much. And we've got uh, more questions for Daniel, but I, I want to make sure that other people also can, can get involved in the conversation. So I would like to come back to, um, to uh, Ishita and ask her if, if you, uh, for example, or young people, as, as Daniel pointed out, young people are being involved in these participatory processes to develop governance uh, of, of marine cloud brightening. What, what are some of the um, uh, hopes and concerns that you think young people uh, will bring or could bring into these discussions? Um, yeah, thank you. So I think while young people, like many other communities, don't have a consolidated stance as to for SRM or against SRM, I think we do understand the gravity of our current circumstances and are in favor of research and experimentation of SRM to better understand its short-term and long-term impacts. Um, and to be prepared in the event of a climate emergency, um, I think now is the time to establish internationally coordinated open SRM research programs, as well as start designing inclusive governance architecture. Um, I think, but one of the main concerns harbored by um, many of the young people I've engaged with is, is the lack of inclusivity on current SRM activities. Um, many developing countries would stand to gain or lose the most if SRM was ever deployed. Um, however, despite this, most of the research and discussion of SRM is taking place in, in developed, highly industrialized countries. Um, and to make the vision of open and global discussion on SRM a reality, um, my peers and I hope that solar geoengineering research on a, on a large scale um, can be independently conducted beyond Europe and North America and um, in more like in developing regions and also um, empowering these developing regions to to run their own consultations on SRM and develop their own stances. Um, this can be funded from funding can be acquired from different sources but i think the main point is to ensure that um these consultations are, are locally led but globally connected um and that being said i think another interesting point um which might have been brought up before is uh it's important to highlight that um in the global discussion on SRM that um, these technologies are only a temporary fix. Um, it's, it's a means to buy us some much needed time in the race to net zero. It, it's a way to offset the detrimental impacts of global warming, which we're not yet equipped to face. But at some point, uh, no amount of SRM deployment will suffice to lower temperatures. And this could potentially cause a massive and rapid surge in global temperatures. And, Thus, it's so, so important that SRM doesn't uh, make nations misdirect their attentions from ambitious actions needed to meet the 1.5 degree promise of the Paris Agreement. Um, and I think this is an important idea to explore. Um, however, through my engagement with, with youth segments, um, some methods to increase um, surface albedo seem more popular than others. Um, methods employing similar concepts to SRM. Um, these include uh, brightening human settlements, um, introducing more reflective crop varieties, placing large uh, desert reflectors, um, large-scale afforestation in deserts, um, large-scale deforestation at high latitudes, and even making oceans brighter with, with safe chemicals. I think by conducting safe and small-scale SRM experiments, um, we, we believe that governments can build the trust and capacity for future geoengineering proposals and activities um, that may be more radical in, in nature. So thank you. Thank you very much. And then I'd like to come just briefly back to Simona in relation to this um, question about the potential for mitigation deterrence or moral hazard, the dilemma, um, the concern that being able to the idea of potentially in the future being able to cool the planet via uh, SRM approaches may lower the perceived need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's considered to by some to be a risk of researching, even though these small experiments are, are not designed to, uh, to do this. Um, what are your thoughts on this issue and how governance may help to mitigate the risk? Thank you. Thank you very much, Miranda. Yes, um, I, in fact, um, go back to what Daniel was saying that uh, in fact, uh, he was 
he argued, and, and uh, this was very good news to hear, that the experiments that are currently being conducted and um, by, by Australia would only work if, if we really continue with our ambition to reduce emissions as much as possible and as soon as possible. So that is already, I think, um, quite comforting to hear. And we hope that all states have this kind of ethos in their approach, even if they carry out this, these um, SRM methodologies in situ in, on very, very small scale. Um, with respect to um, uh, the risk, yes, it is unfortunately human nature that we tend to uh, go for the easier option, the, the one that doesn't affect our behavioral trends, the, the one that is least costly in the short term. So this is this is why it's it's always considered as a risk in, in diverting the attention from focusing on, on um, climate neutrality, achieving climate neutrality as soon as possible, because obviously a lot of countries, even for social reasons, uh, are finding it very, very challenging to, to wean themselves of fossil fuels. Um, so it's that the risk is there. Uh, however, what I wish also to add uh, is that um, in hearing what our Australian colleagues were explaining, clearly um, one can see that a very, very um, uh, well-structured governance framework is essential uh, for such experiments because it is um, it, it evaluates the scale of risk which we were talking about it is also all um, evident that the there is transparency in the kind of observation results that we get and uh, and what Jan was uh, was referring to um, earlier that in reality the international regime does not exclude these experiments as a possible support for adaptation, that is true. Um, and, and we have the obligation to help ourselves. I mean, th that is why science exists. This is why humans uh, delve into research. If these offer a real just ethical solution uh, with the kind of observation that we need without uh, with ensuring the kind that the risks can be managed as much as possible, yes, definitely, this is the way forward. And, we need all the help we can get. Uh, it's, it's also true, however, that the absence in the international regime is the risk element. Uh, when an activity is not specifically prohibited as being harmful, um, then the, the, the chance is that an, uh, a country can carry out such experiments which have repercussions beyond borders uh, would not be regulated in the sense, would not be excluded. So while the regime itself, even the UNFCCC regime, promotes the possibility of research and any form of enhancement of, uh, for adaptation measures, uh, at the same time, uh, there is no specific prohibitory um, regime, like you have, for example, with respect to nuclear testing in outside um, national jurisdiction, uh, then obviously that is a cause of, a, of alarm and concern, especially for countries that cannot keep up with the, with the research and with the possibility of um, defending themselves if there, there are um, other countries that opt to carry out such, such experiments without taking all the necessary precautions at the national level, as we have seen and we have heard from our Australian colleagues. I think these are the um, ethical issues, the dilemmas that um, I think even Ishita was referring to, if, uh, if, I, if I understood her correctly. Thank you. Thanks, Simona. And then uh, coming back to a couple of related questions in the chat, um, one from uh, Ezio Amato. <laughs> Uh, many thanks to all, uh, mainly for Daniel. Do you think we have enough knowledge on marine ecosystems functioning to be in a condition of measuring, observing, being aware of the most uh, uh, of most of the unplanned effects of marine cloud brightening or other techniques may have uh, on that particular ecosystem? So this relates to um, unexpected or unknown side effects that that, that the um, the intervention may have. So it's, it's obviously very intervention specific, that question. 
Um, so what we're doing in, in one whole sub program of the reef restoration and adaptation program is, is started a selection of monitoring sites, um, sort of more in-depth ecological and, and biological monitoring, I think, that's, that's probably ever been undertaken on the reef before. And so they've established these bunch of sites and they're, they're doing it with that specific design goal in mind to understand how these different interventions might impact the coral community um, and the ecology of the coral community, you know, were they to be applied and were they to be scaled up. Uh, so that the research is absolutely happening. I'm not an ecologist or a, or a biologist, so I, I can't answer too much in the in the details of that. Um, I think in the, in the case of marine cloud brightening, as it's envisioned for the reef, um, I mean the, the the effects are the sort of the direct effects as far as the marine ecosystem is concerned are, are fairly predictable. It's it's a, a reduction in incoming solar radiation, change in the albedo of the clouds. And, you know, of course, these, these changes are very well within the natural variability that we have, um, you know, between sort of cloudy and, and uncloudy days and even cloudy and, and, and slightly less cloudy years, right? There's quite a lot of variability, uh, for instance, between a, a El Nino year and a, and a La Nina year or, or even an El Nino year and a neutral year, uh, quite a lot of difference in the cloud cover, even more than, than would be sort of achieved by the cloud brightening. Um, and, and interestingly, the, the clouds where, you know, some of this research is, is eludicating just how important the clouds are in the actual bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef. We tend to have the bleaching events in those summers where there's less cloud cover because corals actually bleach from um, both the warm water and excess light energy. So um, it, it doesn't completely answer your, your question to the highest level of detail, I'm afraid, but, but, but there's a part of the program that's looking into that. Uh, it's just not my expertise exactly, um, but, but we're certainly doing our very best to cover it off. Thanks, Daniel. And then coming back to the question that I directed to Jan before about a, a, a guidebook for good practice, uh, I misread it as a, as a governance good practice, but uh, we could also read it as a good practice for, for you know, planning and carrying out such experiments. Uh, do, do you plan to disseminate uh, the lessons learned and, and in what fashion? Sorry, Daniel, I think uh, I was directing that question to you. I'm not sure if I didn't make that. Question. Oh, sorry, I thought you said Jen. <laughs> I did. I directed it to Jan previously and she deflected and said, I think it's not about governance good practice, but rather about uh, uh, research good practice. So I'm, I'm redirecting it back to you. Sure. So I, I, I haven't heard anybody suggest that we should write a guidebook exactly so far, but, but it could be an excellent suggestion. But, but certainly, um, you know, the entire RAP program, including the governance structure, um, is designed to be as transparent as we can possibly make it. So if anybody's interested in, in the governance structure of RAP, I, I suggest that they, they have a look at the website. Um, but I, I think... Um, Certainly the, the social science, and, and actually I should have mentioned, we have a, a, a regulatory uh, sub-program as well that, that's uh, specifically doing, doing similar research to Jen in terms of looking at whether the Australian regulation um, is fit for practice in managing these very, very novel type ecosystem interventions that we're just beginning to research. And so I imagine that, that as that team starts to, to publish their findings, that, that that's probably where you would, would find the guidance as to how we've set up our program and, and attempted to do best practice. Wonderful, thanks very much. Um, and then we have one last question in the chat, which I would um, uh, use as an opportunity to to also hand back over to Janos Pastor for some final words. The question is, um, will C2G summarize this information uh, in a paper and make it make it available this session as being very interesting? So I'd hand that over to Janos and also um, hand over to him at this point for for some concluding comments. Thank you, Miranda. So for, first to the question. Uh, what we are planning is to make available the, uh, the video, the recording. It will be available on our website. It will take some days. Uh, so don't look for it this afternoon. <laughs> uh, but um, when we make these videos available, we tend to identify a few clips uh, that are interesting, that highlight the discussion. So we, we, that's what we have planned. We have not planned a, a summary report, but it's something we can consider and we'll see whether 
uh, we are able to, to put uh, that together either ourselves or with the help of, of others. So that's uh, in terms of the, uh, the response to the question. And then, uh, uh, so I was asked to, to, to say a few words at the end. Uh, um, first of all, thank you to uh, the panelists uh, for coming up with some really interesting ideas about their work. And thank you to the people who have asked questions. I think it was a very rich discussion and I would need more than two minutes to be able to summarize uh, uh, what, what we heard. But I did hear a couple of very interesting points, and I just want to, to raise a few. So one of them clearly is that we don't always talk, uh, we don't always use the same terminology about the same thing. So let's be clear always about what we're talking about, whether, whether you use geoengineering or climate altering techniques, that doesn't matter. That's, but let's be clear uh, what what we mean, what is defined, what is included in those terminologies. What, we, what I also heard very clearly from all of the speakers is that uh, marine cloud brightening is not a solution. It is not a solution, but it can be uh, a supplement uh, at times, as, uh, as we heard, uh, uh, when, when it's really needed in certain parts uh, of the world uh, or in certain regions uh, within countries. Uh, so then then and that was an interesting discussion from different angles that we need to we, we need to embed governance uh, of mcb of marine cloud brightening into existing governance frameworks of other issues link them connect them and so let's not try to govern these new emerging techniques in silos but let's try to deal with them in the context of broader society and and then some of those needs can be done very much at the local level, sometimes at the regional level, and sometimes at the global level, but always connected back into the local uh, level. And, uh, and I, I have to say that at the end, that they all have to make sure that uh, the youth are engaged in that process because they're going to have to live with this stuff uh, for a much longer time than some of us. So. I, 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 these are just a few things that I pulled out. This is by, by no means a, a summary. Um, I think it's also clear from, and I wanted to say this at the end, that it was clear from this discussion, but also from other uh, knowledge that uh, these kinds of issues really need transdisciplinary knowledge. And, 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 and that's, uh, uh, that's the only way uh, we, can under, we can make use of these to, to help. Uh, with our Paris uh, temperature goals. Um, it's uh, what, what I hope and what my colleagues uh, in C2G hope that this discussion can, that uh, today's uh, event can help to kickstart other discussions, uh, not just those who were day-to-day -day involved with marine cloud brightening, but a broader set of uh, discussions between different stakeholders uh, who ultimately are working uh, for a better world uh, both in terms of the environment, the people, and the economy as well. And uh, uh, we, we, we do think that the Ocean Conference that is taking place right now, the Ocean Decade, and of course, the negotiations under UNCLOS, CBD, et cetera, some of these have been mentioned today, uh, are uh, presenting timely opportunities to address knowledge and some governance gaps of SR. But we also believe that the UN General Assembly may also play an important role in setting the overall context, particularly for those aspects that are global in uh, nature, uh, and to be able to connect the required governance processes between different actors, such as uh, the ocean process, and of course, others as well. So uh, with that, thank you very much for uh, uh, everybody's participation. And uh, uh, let's move on and look forward to another one, another one like this at some point in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We're done. Thanks. Thank you. Good night.